ladies and gentlemen, thanks for tuning into The Scoop. I'm your host, Frank Chaparro, Director of Special Projects at The Block, and we have Craig Burel, Purell, Burel, <laughs> joining us from Reciprocal Ventures. Thanks so much for taking the time. Yeah, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for having me. Great to be here. Yeah, the pleasure's all ours. So obviously, I mean, you guys, I think we're quite, I mean, I know Solana is a part of the portfolio. This past yep. week has really been... It's been interesting to see from a just a market's perspective, um, Solana kind of break out while everything's sort of falling. Um, just that's typically not the case, yeah. right? Everything always seems so in lockstep. Um, but we'll get to that. Let's just start maybe <laughs> more um, broadly with your story, how you got sure. into crypto and what, what sort of the firm's mandate is. Yeah. Um, so I had kind of like a winding road experience getting into crypto. Started my career in TradFi, as you know, a lot of people in crypto did. Uh, I was working on the equity trading floor at Morgan Stanley, and a good mm. friend of mine tried to orange pill me back in like very early, like 2011, 2012. Mm -hmm. um, turns out that he went to Duke, and he was roommates with Fred Ursum there. Oh wow! So, so you know, I guess they were both you know real, real early, uh, and I was kind of just getting my trad fi career started was like, mm -hmm. this seems a little too risky for me. Um, but that said, you know, I was covering tech companies at the time. Uh, I was super interested in, um, you know, the entrepreneurial grind and wanted to get more into deeper, more nascent technologies. So I decided to make the jump out of, uh, out of Morgan Stanley and joined a early stage AI company called Fiscal Note. Um, early NLP company, 2014 seed stage. I was the first kind of growth go to market hire. Um, and it was definitely before AI was cool. Uh, mm -hmm. it was kind of like selling AI to enterprises back then was like selling crypto to enterprises in like 2022, 2023. It was just, you know, tough sell, but, uh, yeah. but we ended up scaling that business up, you know, built and then rebuilt the revenue engine several times, scaled it up to 10 million ARR in under three years. And uh, that was actually where I like started falling down the rabbit hole. So we were a regulatory and compliance AI company. So we brought on a bunch of crypto companies, including Coinbase as customers. And, you know, figured I might as well try out the tech and, and use it at that point, created a Coinbase account, started playing around with, with Ethereum and some of the early protocols there. And that's when it kind of, you know, I had my light bulb moment uh, kind of, kind of all made sense having, you know, been in capital markets on the sell side, you know, I started looking at Ethereum and the, you know, global state machine world computer kind of vision, some of the protocols, well, like a lot of the protocols that were, you know, super early 2016, 2017 were DeFi focused. Um, you know, so I just kind of saw this world of potential in terms of disintermediation of, you know, financial, uh, intermediaries and, um, you know, definitely felt that with, uh, with my experience and background at Morgan Stanley. So I uh, had an opportunity to uh, jump to uh, the dark side and, and join Reciprocal as my partner, Mike, was getting the firm spun up in, in 2016, early 2017. He had a very different background than myself. So he came from the buy side. He was you know, mm -hmm. coming off uh, you know, 15 years of, of working at large global hedge fund. He was one of the first portfolio managers to cover the internet for Steve Cohen in the 90s. You know, mm. invested all through you know the Web One era, Web Two era, super successful track record. Uh, started investing, you know, on the private side when they uh, they launched Point Seventy Two Ventures, and then mm -hmm. eventually decided to start his own firm, and that was the kind of genesis of of Reciprocal. Um, so when I, you know, originally Reciprocal was was intended to be a more of a fintech focused firm, and when I was interviewing with Mike, I kind of made this pitch that. You know, crypto and and you know protocols like Ethereum and those being built on Ethereum were were kind of the future of fintech, right? This is like mm -hmm. the next iteration of fintech and would eventually disintermediate fintech from the from the ground up. Um, you know, when when looking at a lot of fintech plays at at that time, it was you know slapping a new UX or UI on top of old archaic bank technology or bank rails. So, um, you know, I made the I made the push for us to focus on on the space. And, you know, from there it was kind of, okay, how do we go about this? What, what's our unique edge? What's our strategy in the space? And, uh, yeah, that was early 2017. How do you make the shift from trader to VC? Um, 
um, in a, in addition to just sort of, you know, taking a lot of meetings and coffees and, <laughs> you know, what's the meme that VCs don't really do anything all day if <laughs> except for talk to people. Um, <laughs> no, no, that's a meme though. It's not true. No, I know, I know, I know. But how do you make um, the shift from the mentality of a trader yeah. to the mentality of a VC? And what is the difference between the two? Yeah, I'll say, I mean, I was a little bit more research focused on the trading floor. Um, so I was kind of like I digging see. into companies, you know, putting forward trade ideas, theses for, you know, how certain pair trades and things could play out. Um, and so that's when mm -hmm. I started realizing that I like really like digging into technology and really understanding it, understanding how markets operate. Um, I also, you know, did have some entrepreneurial experience. I, I co-founded a company with my brother in college and, you know, it was semi-successful mm -hmm. for a few years. We ended up winding it up when I got my job at Morgan Stanley, my brother went to go work at UBS. So, um, nothing really came of it, but, you know, I had kind of gone down that path before. So, you know, when I got the entrepreneurial itch at, at Morgan Stanley, I, I thought to myself, like I could go into venture, you know, I have some kind of like research experience now, some proper professional experience. I could go, you know, do the venture job. A lot of times you go into venture or that early in your career, you end up being an associate and you get punted out into a portfolio company one day to go get operator experience. I was like, might as well just go get operator experience myself, you know? Um, so that's why I joined, mm. joined fiscal note. Um, I think the plan was always to eventually get into, into venture. I, I love capital markets. I love investing. Um, I love deep technology. So it was kind of like the perfect fusion of those, those disciplines. Um, and, uh, so yeah, it was just, I felt like I need to get some operator experience for me personally, before I made that, made that leap to, uh, to the venture world. I also felt like I wanted to be able to empathize with founders, you know, when working with them, it's a huge part of like how I operate personally as a, as an investor. And then also how we operate as a firm that like, we're very, very hands-on, like we provide a, a ton of support, you know, daily, weekly meetings with, with founders help a lot on go to market. That's, you know, my background from fiscal note as an operator was in go to market. So I take a lot of those playbooks and, and tend to, you know, customize them for each of our portfolio companies and, and deploy them, you know, together with the founders. How does the sort of dynamic of many of these different projects or protocols having, you know, decentralized communities impact the way in which you may be engaged with a specific um, founder? How is it different than just investing in a, a, a standard company via equity? Um, how is that different from investing in a, in a token with this whole community um, that may sometimes get unruly or, or um, hard to sort of completely uh, get your, your, your arms around? Yeah. It's a great question. And like, it's honestly something we've spent like the last seven, eight years thinking about and refining. I think what I've found is, is there are some things that are very similar uh, to mm. more traditional go to markets. And there are some things that are super unique. Um, one of the things that's, that's similar is I think your early go to market should be based on, you know, flagship customers that believe in your protocol that will find some concrete value proposition in your protocol. And you can then leverage those to build confidence, those wins, those kind of like blue chip, win, you know, customers, so to speak, as, you know, your flag in the ground in the DeFi vertical or, you know, in the NFT vertical or wherever you're selling in, in the space. And that's very similar to strategy that we used at, at fiscal note, which at the end of the day was a SaaS company, right? Very common strategy in general for, you know, seed stage finding product market fit. I think where, where it differs a little bit is, is the thing that you mentioned around community where, you know, while you're, while you're working mm -hmm. on one side on a, you know, a B2B motion, right. For lack of a better phrase, uh, you also have to manage a kind of grassroots, you know, developer focused network effect at, at the same time, um, which I think you can look to, uh, you know, dev tools in web mm. two, you can look to open source in web two, you know, they have that, that similar motion. Um, but I find it's kind of a, a combination of those two disciplines, which can be a little bit unique. What do you think about, um, 
how do you how do you see how has the venture space in crypto evolved over the past few cycles? How has it changed um, in your in your view? Yeah, I think it's definitely grown, right? I think you know we went from a time where you know we had some some just very like early believers, you know, back in back in 2017. And, mm-hmm. and to be honest, like a lot of the early firms back then, you know, like us, we were all kind of figuring it out together. And there was this mentality of, you know, let's, let's grow the pie. Let's, you know, fund new experimental projects. And I think the spirit of that still exists, but I think you've started to see firms figure out what makes them unique in the space or what makes them different. Um, you've definitely seen more specialization come into mm. the market. And I think that's one thing that that we've leaned into, uh, especially over the last four years or so. You know, I think we know what we're good at. You know, we love doing pre-seed, seed, series A, early pre-token launch projects. You know, we lean in and helping them find product market fit, um, you know, by being very hands-on and providing that constant support. Um, so, you know, that's kind of our differentiator. That's our you know, our unique focus in the market. Um, and I think you've seen a lot of other firms do that as well. Um, it's created, I think, you know, at times a, a slightly more structured discipline cadence to, to funding in the market. And, you know, at other times it, uh, it gets a little, a little crazy, but, uh, but yeah, I think, I think that's, that's what I've seen uh, shift. How specialized can we get from a category perspective? Yeah. Obviously, I've been thinking about launching my own meme meme coin fund. Frank, I think that would be that would be quite successful. I think you should launch your own meme coin first and get the get the the hands on experience. That way, you know you can coach yeah, the meme Frank, coin founders. Ch- Frank Ch- per, pay, Piro coin, I guess you would call it. <laughs> yeah, I like that. Um, so I d- I don't necessarily believe we need to. So for us, I can speak for reciprocal and reciprocal only, but mm-hmm. you know, for us, we don't. We consider ourselves crypto generalists, so we don't like necessarily specialize specifically in one micro category within crypto. I do think crypto is is you know fairly niche enough as a as a sector, so I feel pretty comfortable uh, you know that we're specialists in crypto and that's specialized enough. But I do think there are you know specialized value adds, specialized support mechanisms. Um, specialized entry points in terms of when you make your initial investment. Um, that's, that's what I mean in terms of, you know, strategy. Yeah. In terms of the stage and how you're working with these founders and projects. Um, so where are we in the, um, cycle right now from a venture perspective, valuations are looking pretty, pretty crazy, aren't they? I mean, it feels like just yesterday, we were recording an episode of the show with with Mike Dudas, and let's yeah. call it end of August or, sep- or early September mm-hmm. of uh, last year, and the market was dead. There were no deals. <laughs> now it's in a short span of just a, I guess you'd say half a year. You're getting, you know, you're getting Series A's at a billion dollar valuations again. Yeah, it's nuts. Well. <laughs> Yeah, I think a couple of things. So first of all, I think the ETF changed the game in a big way. We're starting to see, you know, the market recapture. Gave these founders massive, massive heads. <laughs> yes. Yeah. De- that. Yeah. That's definitely one of the side effects. Um, <laughs> a lot of capital inflows. Like, you know, Bitcoin's mm-hmm. a bit of a gateway drug. We're seeing massive capital inflows into Bitcoin. That capital flows elsewhere into the ecosystem. You know, once people get marked up a little bit, get get some returns on on their BTC. Um, and then we see alt yeah. rotations, and then meme coin rotations, and NFT rotations. Um, you know, I also think for whatever reason, a, a, a lot of funds were caught off sides the last two years. I, I'm not sure why, yeah. but it feels like a, a lot of firms weren't deploying capital. You know, I think we were deploying capital pretty actively in 2022 and 2023, and it. You know, it felt like we were seeing the same handful of firms. Mike, you know, we saw Mike Dudas quite a bit at Six Man. Um, so, yeah, I'm not I'm not sure what was going on or you know why why they were you know a little bit slower. But 
it seems like now, you know, post ETF, they're coming back into the market pretty aggressively. I think, you know, they're, they're going after similar plays to what we've seen over the last several years, like new L1s, new L2s, new VMs, um, you know, a little bit of a, you know, a momentum kind of style of, of deployment. Um, and they're very competitive rounds. You know, people are coming in with very, very large mm. checks. They're getting oversubscribed really quickly. Um, they're also happening in multiple tranches, which I haven't seen in, in, in years. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah. What, what, um, I think I know what you mean by that for maybe, but for listeners who don't like you're seeing a few seat extensions or special purpose yeah. vehicles, um, uh, sort of existing, um, in tandem with a given round, um, you, you do a seed and then a, a month later there's the series a, is that what you're sort of talking about? It's just all happening so quick and the rounds are in, either in quick succession of one another or they're happening amidst different types of structures. Yeah. I mean, you see, you, you'll see, you know, an investor come in and, and, you know, offer, offer some terms for a, you know, maybe, maybe slightly smaller initial round. And then, you know, that will trigger a bunch of interest in follow on investors. And, you know, the round, let's say is like five X oversubscribe. So the founder doesn't necessarily want that capital to, to just disappear and, and go to waste. So they'll say, okay, we're going to create a, a second round, but it's going to be marked up at a higher valuation. And you guys can mm-hmm. all follow in into that round. And then we've even started to see, you know, KOL key opinion leader rounds that are, you know, a third tranche marked up again at another higher valuation. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I actually don't even know if I saw that in the last cycle, but. Um, Interesting. But, but to answer your question, I mean, like, you know, historically things like, you know, the happening is, is typically kind of like the supply shock that, that triggers the, the major movement. Um, and, you know, we haven't even hit that yet. So. So do you have to put your, maybe put your feet on the, on the brakes a little bit right now? I don't know about that. I think to be honest, I think there are still places to find reasonably valued opportunities in crypto. It's just, it's just about where you're looking. we we very much believe that there's this kind of like constant tension between the infrastructure and application layers over the last, I believe over the last several years, you know, we've funded some really strong infrastructure projects that have brought new capabilities, new scalability, opened up the design space for crypto. I think now is a great time to be focusing more on the application side of things as opposed to the infrastructure. Um, so, you know, that's where we're looking, um, you know, and I, and I think that's where we're going to find, you know, better deals and be able to do more discipline underwriting, you know, not necessarily chase momentum and price things up. Mm. So it, it's interesting. It takes a bit of, um, takes discipline and bears to, con- to maintain conviction. Um, it takes an equal amount of discipline and a bull to not get over your skis in a sense or allocate and deploy too much or in areas yeah. that you're maybe not an expert in, but you're just doing it because it's the, the coin de jour, as it were. Yeah. I mean, we think a lot about style drift and just making sure that we're not, you know, just because an ETF passed and, you know, a lot of capital is coming into the space, making sure that we're not getting out of our lane or doing anything that we wouldn't have done last year. Right. Um, making sure that we're staying within mandate, staying in bounds of, of, you know, what we're designed to do as a firm. So uh, let's talk about maybe maintaining conviction in, in a, a bear. I saw mm-hmm. our friend Jenya, tweet at you, um, congratulating you and a few other VCs for, uh, not abandoning Solana, despite the, um, association with one Sam Bankman freed. What, what sort of, um, what underpins, what underpinned that conviction? Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we've known the Solana team for a very long time. We initially invested in, in them in 2018. Um, you know, know Raj and Tolly really well. And I think, um, you know, one thing that's allowed me to maintain conviction, you know, obviously they're fantastic technologists and operators, like no one can doubt that. 
Um, but additionally, they've created a culture both on the core team, the foundation team, and in the ecosystem around commercialization, being use case oriented, really pushing the envelope in terms of growing the design space of crypto, but then also finding impl implementations and projects to demonstrate that. Um, so, you know, while things were getting really bad in late 2022, early 2023, we were starting to learn about some really interesting developments going on in Solana, things that would, you know, help with the outages. They were going to ship fee markets to help with fee pricing and surges and, and spam. Uh, they were work, starting to work on token 2022, which became token extensions, um, mm -hmm. which were, you know, deliberate requests from large payment processors, large you know, financial intermediaries that want to work on, on Solana and launch projects on Solana. Um, so it was things like this where, you know, we just felt like there was, there was so much left to do with this technology and so much, so much more room to run in terms of what mm -hmm. it was capable, capable of. Um, additionally, I think like we started, uh, a big part of how we operate is we like, you know, working, um, you know, very closely to the, the core developers to understand where things are kind of breaking uh, in real time. Um, so, you know, we had this, we had a couple application level portfolio companies on Solana, started to learn that the infrastructure being provided on Solana just wasn't really, you know, up to par. So we started developing this thesis around, you know, verticalization of infrastructure provisioning on high performance chains. Um, Short, shortly after starting working on that thesis, we met Mert, um, who was in the process of founding Helios. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, he had just kind of left Coinbase. They didn't want to expand to Solana at the time. You know, he was singing kind of the same tune as us. Um, so he kind of committed very deliberately to providing this verticalized infrastructure so that consumer applications could eventually proliferate on Solana. And I think, um, you know, that also, you know, working very closely with him, understanding, you know, some of the newest applications that are getting launched in the space on the chain, you know, just kept us very bullish, like even despite the noise and everything going on on crypto Twitter. Did you, um, it's funny, right? Because I think a lot of people are wondering when there's going to be this profusion of, of applications, um, our companies come to market that are actually building um, consumer type things that people can use versus another layer one or another layer two. Of course. I'm sure we have the data um, uh, on the block co mm -hmm. um, or at least our, our professional venture dashboard, which if you're a venture professional and you're listening to this show, you should check it out. But I mean, it's 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 every at least the ones that catch cap, capture the headlines, um, they're just all <laughs> new layer ones. I think there was a meme on Twitter. Someone said a man, you know, would 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 sooner, you know, it's that classic the therapy meme. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. You know, a, a, a man, a crypto person, um, would would rather launch a new layer one at a billion plus dollar valuation and go to therapy, Thank God to therapy um, right. and they'd rather do that than also launch an app, right? Because it's just more value, right? If your layer one wins and everyone builds stuff on top of it, that's going to, that's the most upside. Yeah. I think that's also indicative of where we are in the cycle, right? I think every time, you know, we're early, we see this, right? We see like redundant funding of, of infrastructure uh, in the market and, you know, it seems like the play at, at the time. Um, I think, you know, if you think back to later in last cycle, we started to see applications start to proliferate, like things like step in, right. Started to start to catch on and get traction. Um, I think we're going to see the same type of thing play out. So, you know, what gets me really excited, right. Is that we've just onboarded millions of new people, right. Thanks to, thanks to meme coins. Now, we all know this stuff rotates, works in cycles. Where is that capital going to eventually go? So that's what I've been I've been thinking about for the last couple of weeks, last month is, you know, what are the next use cases that these people try on chain now that they're onboarded into crypto? Um, you know, a lot of people I think would make the case that they go to NFTs, but I'm not necessarily sure that's true. Mm. How 
connected are these cycles? Um, do private markets lag liquid uh, public token markets? Yes. And do those lag meme coin markets? What's the sort of interconnection between? Yeah. Uh, and and then do meme coins lag NFTs? Well, meme coins are the new NFT for this market, yes. but how, how do they sort of um, uh, maybe follow each other, et yeah. cetera? Well, to answer your first question, uh, uh, private markets lag public markets by quite a bit. Um, you know, just think about it, right? So like Bitcoin started reverting into kind of a bullish trend post banking crisis last year, right? Mm -hmm. And it's done, it's done pretty well since. Um, we're just kind of starting to see signs, you know, real strong signs of life on the private side. Um, you know, I think even in, in Q4, you know, it, the market was heating up, but it wasn't really hot yet. Um, I'd say, mm -hmm. I'd say now it's getting much better. I think when we, we hit a certain amount of appreciation in, in majors, things tend to start to boil over into other asset categories in the space and other use cases in the space. So like the way I think about it, right. Is like, if you're using something on chain or you own an asset in, you know, a soul flare wallet on Solana, for example, like what are the odds that you're going to just straight up cash that out back, back to your bank account? If you have, you know, a modest gain, uh, or what's the odds that you're going to go to a stable coin and start using, you know, some of the DeFi 2.0 apps that have been built on Solana, like a Camino. Um, you know, funny things happen during during crypto market cycles. So for example, right now, you know, there's definitely some hunger for leverage on, you know, in DeFi, right? We're seeing APYs of 20% yeah. on, Cam on Camino right now to deposit stables, um, which... I remember being a key leading indicator, you know, of the, of the mega run last cycle. So, you know, if you're, if you get modest gain on a, a meme coin or even on, you know, BTC or ETH or soul, you know, are you going to go back to your, your bank account into, into cash, or are you going to take 20% APY just by loaning some money out on a DeFi protocol? On-chain yields are back. I mean, you They're can back, just look baby. at the T TVL and Athena. It's one interesting example. Um, yeah, better better than Treasuries by a wide margin. So yeah, and easier to use. Yeah, I mean, there's there's like a ton of other things going on too. Like there's you know on chain gaming is is starting to come online. We have a portfolio company, Photo Finish, that's doing crazy well on on Solana. A ton of traction. Um, you know our uh, are you a wine guy, Frank? Mm -hmm. I've been using a wine app called Divin. I don't know if you've ever heard of it. Mm -mm. It's fantastic. It's, What's it it's, on? Uh, it's actually on Polygon. Uh, oh. But uh, yeah, um, but it's super fun. So they do wine drops and you can collect wine with as NFTs essentially. Hmm. Uh, and when you buy the wine, so they go to the producer and uh, they onboard the, the producer to, you know, do some kind of rare wine drop from their library. And uh, you can participate, you can buy the wine, store it in your wallet as an NFT. The producer and Divin will figure out storage. They either keep it in their library or on-site storage facilities or ship it to a third party, you know, the the qualified custodian of wine if you will and uh you can anytime you want you can claim it you can essentially like burn that nft and then take delivery of the wine and i guess the idea is longer term they want to build a like loyalty business loyalty platform between the producers and the consumers directly so every time you drink a bottle of wine that you buy from one of these drops you'll collect a bounty of uh of tokens of points or tokens, um, in exchange for providing a bunch of mm -hmm. metadata about yourself, about, you know, the people you drank it with, where you were, if you were at a restaurant or not. Um, 
And uh, then you can cash in those tokens or points uh, for experiences, just like with Amex points or airline miles. One thing that we've talked about on this show a number of times is the extent to which these products um, about which um, many of these products that you're, you're sort of expecting to come, they, they, I guess they, they enter during the later stage of a, of a cycle. Mm -hmm. What gives them sticking power once the public token markets don't do as hot? Because you use step in, it's an interesting yeah. example. It was a, it's a, it, it was a decent product, but once Solana goes or the tokens associated with the product, I think it was GMT. There was a few different ones. Um, yeah. Yep. Once those tokens go down in value, you kind of have the oxygen sucked out of what people really were using that thing for. Um, so how then, I guess, to put a finer point on the question, and how do you, and this is something that I'm sure you 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 talk with with talk to your team about as well as portfolio companies. Mm -hmm. How can these products transcend the price of these tokens? As an example, right? I'm 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 not going to use Amazon less because um, maybe their stock price goes down, and even with something that might be more analogous um, uh, to to crypto, I'm not going to. I mean, I guess it's actually not too dissimilar from like if you're an Uber and obviously the VC money sort of uh, allowing you to suppress prices once you kind of maybe once that money stops rolling in um, and now, you know, you've got to raise prices and people use Uber less because they don't have those incentives um, and the token kind of just adds an incentive. But anyway, without going on and on too much, um, how can these products like transcend token price, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I think, I'm first sorry of all, about the rambling I, listeners. I was getting, I, <laughs> no, just no, sort of thinking through it. Was, it. it was a, it was a really good rant. Um, so I think it's no secret. We need to work on token economics. First of all, like just being candid, I think token economics are, it's a very early science. I think many times it's more art than science. Um, so I think there's a lot to be figured out there. Um, you know, something I constantly counsel our, uh, portfolio companies on is, you know, please don't use your, your token in your payment flow. And I think there's, you know, there's a, a trend where, you know, projects want to have as much advertised utility for their token as possible. And, um, you mm. know, I think when you have it, when you have the, the native token baked into a payment flow, it can create a bunch of issues. First of all, it's, it's creating a ton of friction for the payer, right? For the person who has to own that token and, and, you know, use it, pay it into a system instead of using something like USDC. Um, but additionally, let's say in like a, you know, like a infrastructure protocol or something, you know, if you're providing a service or in a deep end network, right. And you're providing a service to that deep end network with a sensor or some compute or something, you're receiving that token and it is great during bull times, right. Cause the price is going up, you're getting paid revenue, but then your revenue appreciates in, in multiples during, during the good times. And then on the downside, you know, you have to recognize revenue at some point, right. Especially if, if, especially if you're like a validator company. That's, yeah providing one-off services to a deep end network to help them kind of bootstrap and get up and running. So there's convexity on the upside, right? But there's also convexity on the downside where those, those service providers end up having to recognize revenue and sell, and they start selling at an increasing rate and it kind of just spirals. So maybe a long-winded answer, but I, I think there are a lot of ways that we can, we can improve token economics. I also think you know, you don't need to like token economics are not a go to market alone. Right. And I, I've, I've, this is another thing I, I talk about a lot with our portfolio companies is like, yeah, look, look, what, like, like, I, I think I actually think like, so with Devin is a good example. They're not, they're not a portfolio company, but I've been using that app for two years. 
like they've they've been around since since the last cycle technically i onboarded to that in like 2021 or 2022 something like that um in their like original genesis mint for the their nfts and they haven't launched any you know fluctuating value token uh and they really wanted to find product market fit with a certain cohort of users before you know they explore that that route um and i think they're going to go the the route of you know the the loyalty kind of use case but we'll we'll see um and i think that's the that's the kind of roadmap that that shows a lot more promise it's very rare for a series a company to go public right so it's a unique phenomenon in crypto where yeah. you know you have a handful of customers maybe maybe not maybe you're just going to testnet and you're and you're launching and just figuring it out yeah. right but when you launch a token, it's tough to put it in the back in the box. It's tough to make changes. Um, so I think the more you can yeah. go to market first, figure out where the demand is for the product, block and tackle. That's see, this is actually one of the reasons why I think points is helpful, right? Because it does give you some testing ground for how people will respond to your to your token economics. That's a really good point. That's a really good point because then you don't have the distraction of a token. But you can still gauge. You can, you can tweak it. You can tweak it. Yeah. You know? Because to your point, um, no, that's really that's really well said. You can't put the genie back in the bottle. Yeah. So or in the lamp. You, know, you can't put the toothpaste back in the bottle. Tube. Tube. <laughs> 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 but no, that I, I used to think points were stupid, but I've been evangelized to to see the benefit yeah. um, from com VCs love points. You guys love them. Yeah. Cause, I mean, I think they're an improvement, right? At least we can test things out. You can extend with more seasons. You can, you can figure out how the, the user base on your app is going to respond to the token. And hopefully you can, you can avoid, you know, things that's, you know, mechanisms that spiral out of control and throw your token economy out of whack. I, t I tweeted once, uh, I thought it was funny. I was like, wouldn't it be great if we just took these points, you know, put them on a, put them on an exchange where they could trade on a liquid market. Um, and are on a blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, tokens. <laughs> um, yeah. no, but I wrote about it in the, in the, um, newsletter. Um, recently, like sort of the, the pros and cons, um, they become a, they become a core component almost of this industry, um, which is fascinating. Okay. Closing thoughts. Um, what are you most excited about over the next six months? Ooh, um, look, digging into deep end quite a bit right now. I think, you know, We've just kind of yeah. Everyone's talking about deep. Yeah. Well, we just we've just scratched. I think it was one of those things that was really early last cycle, and you mm -hmm. know I'm excited because we've seen a lot of project migration to Solana, um, just because of the the cost efficiencies, and um, I think we're just scratching the surface uh, in terms of the design space there. Um, excited about RWAs. But more on the collectible side, things like Devin and adding loyalty um, to collectibles. I think that's really interesting. Um, and um, yeah, excited about gaming as well. We'll have a deep in summer, perhaps. We might. We summer. might with some some improved token economics and go to market. Craig, where can listeners learn more about you and the firm? Twitter is probably the best place. Just at Craig Burel and uh, at Rec. VCX. Perfect. Thank you so much for joining the program. Thanks, Ray. And The Scoop will be back for you again with another great guest. Have an awesome day.